I'm Terry Kanoski, and welcome to this month's edition of Kidney Cancer News. Research published in the International Journal of Cancer has shown that daily consumption of whole fruits and vegetables, especially bananas, is highly protective to kidney health. The results show that over 13 years, women eating more than two and a half servings of fruits and vegetables per day cut their risk of kidney cancer by 40%. Among the fruits, bananas were especially protective. Women eating bananas four to six times a week have their risk of developing the disease compared to those who did not eat this fruit. So, as some of the other speakers have already alluded to, uh, kidney cancer is really not one disease, it's a collection of many different types of cancers. And I do believe that as we learn more about the molecular uh, makeup of these tumors, we'll find even more breakdowns of different kidney cancers. And this is a slide that a lot of us uh, show. This is from Marston Linehan, who studies uh, a lot of these inherited cancer genes. And as Dr. Chari already pointed out, these cell types look very different under the microscope, but um, there are roughly uh, there are several different inherited cancers that have given us a lot of insight into how to go about treating these cancers. And this is a list from the World Health Organization. This is their classification of some of the malignant uh, kidney tumors that exist. And as you can see, clear cell is the most common type, but as you can see, there are many other types of cancer that don't really fit that classification. And that's what we're going to, what I'm going to talk about today. So what is rare? Well, papillary kidney cancer is 15% of all kidney cancers. So I don't really think it's rare if you multiply, uh, if you take 15% of uh, 40,000 cases, it's still thousands of patients that are, are affected. And chromophobe is 3%, uh, and the others make up an even smaller proportion of those. But I think you can consider these rare because they are rare to industry. It's hard to get uh, people to focus their attention on these kinds of cancers because um, the squeaky wheel, it isn't, uh, you know, there aren't as many voices shouting about these particular types of cancers. And as Tony already alluded to, Sarcomatoid features are these little spindly cells, and they can arise from any of these other types of kidney cancer. So the cells can actually change into these spindly types of cells, and that can sometimes make the behavior different. And the cancers come from different parts of the kidney. So clear cell and papillary cancer come from the, the nephrons, which are the area that's really kind of making the urine and breaking down the toxins in the body. Um, but the distal nephron, which is the part that carries it more into the collecting system of the kidney, has other cancers that arise from it. And the chromophobe cancer arises a little bit more distally, as does um, collecting duct cancer. And somebody earlier in the audience uh, this morning asked, uh, one of the speakers this morning about tumors of the lining, and they're really, collecting duct cancer is very uncommon, but it's kind of a, a, a cancer that's in between the upper tract tumors and kidney cancer. So we don't treat it as much like we do the more common types of kidney cancer, and we do tend to treat it more like we treat bladder cancer, but it's still considered a kidney cancer. So there's a little bit of a, a gray area in there as well. Um, this is a, uh, Dr. Chawari has already lined this up for me, but um, the things that I'm going to be talking about are drugs that are attacking different targets. And VHL, uh, as he alluded to before, is something that's a, a predominant target in clear cell kidney cancer. But there are other targets that uh, are these targets are also important in papillary cancer and, and in chromophobe, and uh, as you can see, it, it gets very complicated, and I'll be mentioning these also when I'm talking about these rare histologies. 
So several hereditary syndromes have helped to advance the field, and these are these syndromic things that don't occur in very large numbers of patients, but when we study these patients, we learn an awful lot about how to treat the more sporadic kidney cancer. Um, von Hippel-Lindau is an inherited clear cell cancer of the kidney. Uh, these patients are prone not just to uh, cancers and cysts in the kidney, but these can also occur in the brain and in the spine and the eye and the adrenal glands and many different parts of the body. And about 40% of patients can actually have multiple tumors on, on their kidneys on both sides. And inactivation of the VHL gene is what's in their germline, in their, not just in their um, tumor cancer cells, but also in their body, and that's driving this. So this is a picture of a patient of mine who has von Hippel-Lindau disease, and this is an MRI, and you can see these are his kidneys, and you can see just there are just hundreds and thousands of cysts in both of the kidneys. And most of us don't have that, but by studying these unusual patients and, and looking at their tissue, we can learn a lot about how to treat sporadic kidney cancer. Um, papillary cancer, on the other hand, is driven by other genes. And papillary kidney cancer falls into two main su subtypes right now. And I'll say right now because we may end up in a few years dividing this into even more different subtypes. But at least under the microscope, type 1 kidney cancer has a, um, um, a kind of more regular distribution of the cells. It's the more common type of papillary kidney cancer, but it's also a little bit more indolent in that the, the behavior can um, show up as, as hundreds and hundreds of little tumors in both kidneys, um, but they might not spread so fast. So at least early on, what happens is that surgeons will watch this, and when a kidney cancer gets to a particular size, they'll take it out. But they know that they can't get rid of all of the hundreds of tumors, so a lot of it has to do with monitoring. But as the, as the kidney cancer gets more aggressive and spreads, um, one of the things that's been, at least in the hereditary population, important is this uh, gene which makes a protein called MET. And MET is a target that a number of different drugs are in development now for. Um, some of these drugs are specific to MET. Some of them are drugs that treat both VEGF and also MET. And so they're important both in clear cell kidney cancer, but they're also important in some of these non-clear cell types. And some other things that have been discovered to be important in the type 1 papillary are the pathway related to MET, um, which drives uh, a uh, protein called hepatocyte growth factor. And hepatocyte growth factor is a common target of a number of different drugs, uh, for example, Nexavar, targets hepatic growth factor, and that's why Nexavar is being looked at in liver cancer as well. So a lot of these drugs are quite ubiquitous in the types of cancer we use them in. But we think that a number of mechanisms, including the blood vessel formation, such as angiogenesis, uh, cell proliferation, and also motility of cells may be important targets. Whereas hereditary papillary type 2 cancer is a very different cancer. It's it's much more aggressive in its growth. Um, it can come up very quickly. It can spread very quickly. The cells look very different under the microscope. There's more of a reddish or an eosinophilic component to the cells. And in the hereditary form of papillary kidney cancer, the type 2, uh, patients can sometimes get tumors involving the uterus and also tumors involving muscles within the skin so they can get bumps on their skin. And in this particular cancer, the fumarate hydratase gene defect has been found to be an important mutation. In the next slide, this is back to if any of you ever took um, 
organic chemistry, this is the energy cycle that's present in the mitochondria. And what we're finding is that different enzymes in this energy production pathway are important in different kinds of cancer. So here's fum fumarate hydratase. Um, it's important in this part of uh, the energy metabolism. But down here, for example, succinyl CoA um, uh, or succinate um, dehydrogenase is important in a tumor called a paraganglioma, which is a small tumor that sometimes shows up right next to the kidney. And then in um, the uh, glutamyl pathway, which is down here, that's been important, found to be very important in brain tumors. So there's a lot of, this is a very important pathway for some of these aggressive cancers. Um, this is a slide that shows some of the experiences that have been captured for non-clear cell kidney cancer. And I think that the biggest thing to point out in this slide is that these are going back to some of the big studies that were done in kidney cancer in general. So some of your big um, expanded access trials and the big first phase three trial for Satoracel. And so there were hundreds of patients enrolled on these trials and we weren't, uh, back at that time, there wasn't as, um, the, the bigger phase three trials were directed toward clear cell, but as the drugs became more available for, you know, before, before they went to commercial availability, there were these expanded access trials. And in these, some of the patients who enrolled, registered to have access to the drug had non-clear cell cancers, but a lot of these patients had what we call mixed histology. So they had both some clear cell parts of their kidney cancer and also some non-clear cells. So looking back retrospectively at these, we can see that there were some responses to Sutent and also to Nexavar or Serafinib. And there was also activity in, uh, in Temserolimus, at least, or Toracel. Um, but most of these studies are kind of looking back in time. And then this is uh, Dr. Chouari's uh, report where he went back and looked at 41 patients and saw a, a much smaller response to these patients. Um, and these patients, I think, were more pure papillary cancer. And this was a prospective study that was done here at MD Anderson of 23 patients, and I, I didn't put the number here, but it was a very low response rate of about 2% uh, or so. And what I would say about these studies is don't get discouraged because even in this grouping where these s studies were looking at papillary, maybe pure papillary, we're not looking at whether, you know, what kind of mutations these patients had. And so there may be big differences in patients even in, in the papillary subtypes where some of these drugs would still work and they might not work in, in other patients. And I think the take home message here is that we really need to look at these in a more integral marker kind of sense in where patients have biopsies and analysis of their tumor specimens and then we look at these tumor specimens after they've, you know, get perhaps more tissue after they've been treated to see are we hitting targets. And this is a list, uh, this is an excellent review uh, that just came out, and this is a review of some of the different strategies. This is for papillary type 1, so this is, uh, there have been antibodies now that have been directed against um, hepatocyte growth factor, some against MET. Um, and then there are other drugs that directly inhibit the gene and don't um, in, inhibit kind of the, the um, molecules that work against, uh, uh, against the gene or the protein product. And these are some of the therapies, some of which have been completed and some of them are ongoing. And Dr. Bukowski is going to talk about clinical trials later on this afternoon, so I won't spend a lot of time focusing on these. but. It just shows you that uh, there's a whole range of new molecules that are being looked at in papillary kidney cancer. And um, I think a particularly interesting one is this um, XL880, which is uh, ferratinib. 
And this was a trial that was open to patients who either had a mutation of, of MET or were hereditary or where we didn't know anything about the patients. And the company collected information on all of these patients and were, um, I was under the impression that they're going to go do a phase three trial of this, but uh, I'm not sure that that's up and running and, and where that is in um, its current form. And then for type, uh, for the sporadic papillary, again, um, we uh, don't know quite as much about it, but the approaches that are being taken are similar to what we're seeing in the hereditary. And then for hereditary papillary type 2, there's definitely this inactivation of the fumarate hydratase gene, and there's some rationale based on the HIF production that results from this that VEGF pathways are important. There was also an EGF trial of, of um, erlotinib that was done in papillary renal cell, and there was an improvement in um, survival. And based on that, there are a number of different trials going on, some of them looking at a kind of a dual angiogenic, anti-angiogenic approach with bevacizumab and erlotinib, and there have been responses in that as well. What I'd say about sporadic papillary is we really don't know a lot about it yet, um, but MYC activation may be playing a role. And so MYC is a very active tumor oncogene, and perhaps some of the uh, approaches that we use in some other solid tumors, such as lung cancer, uh, may be important in, in approaching this cancer as well. So the conclusions for papillary are, again, we need prospective trials with integral markers uh, to really determine which patients with papillary kidney cancer benefit from VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors, and other agents. But the standard for, of care for right now are really to include any and all of the commercially available agents for renal cell, except uh, perhaps high dose interleukin-2. And I'd really like to make a plug for participation in clinical trials. I think that's really the only way to move the disease forward. I'm going to go a little bit more rapidly over these. This is uh, Bert Hogg Dubé, which is another inherited disorder. And what I'd like to say about that is that a proportion of chromophobe tumors arise from oncocytomas, and there's a mutation in the Bert Hogg Dubé gene, which leads to this um, kind of aberrant production of this folliculin pro protein. And this is perhaps important in, again, in energy metabolism. And there's some data to suggest that um, mTOR inhibitors such as uh, temsorolimus or avirolimus may be potentially important therapies for this subtype. Um, this is an overlap just to show you how complicated this is. This is Bert Hogg Dubé. This is a, something called multiple endocrine neoplasia. These are people that get many different kinds of cancer. And this is tuberous sclerosis, which is another um, gene that affects that part of the pathway called mTOR and leads sometimes to mental retardation, to brain tumors, and to a lot of other unusual kinds of malignancy. And we, but there are some overlaps in, in some of the syndromic things that we see here. And this is a patient who, of mine who took a picture of his skin. He has the Bert Hogg Dubé gene. And these are fibrofolliculomas, so these are kind of, they have a kind of a whitehead appearance. This is a very close-up picture he took of his cheek and emailed to me. And it's unknown, again, in, in, spor in sporadic chromophobe if Bert Hogg Dubé plays an important role. Certainly, we see kit overexpression, and so that lends some interest to whether sutent Imatinib and Desatinib, all of which have KIT as one of their targets, may be an important, um, important things to explore. But these drugs historically have been looked at in mutated KIT, not overexpressed KIT. So again, it's very complicated, but these are things that are falling out of, of what we're learning by studying these cancers up front. And there has been some um, reports of um, improvement, 25% response rate um, in non-clear cell in a 
population of patients who had Sutent, and then uh, there are um, some other, uh, you know, an mTOR certainly has, uh, has a role here. But my conclusions for chromophobe, again, are that uh, chromophobe can behave quite indolently initially, and so local therapies may help to control, ablative therapies may be important in this, but commercially available drugs or a prospective clinical trial that enrolls non-clear cell with integral markers would be a good thing to consider here. And then sarcomatoid uh, kidney cancer, as we said before, can be present in any of these, but it's characterized by a, a kind of a switch to a much more aggressive form of cancer, and it's thought to be represent a biologic transformation to a more aggressive behavior. So patients who have these in their kidneys at the time the kidney is removed may have a much more aggressive uh, active cancer. And this is an area where I think we can say that chemotherapy does have some activity and uh, not just the, uh, the targeted therapies. So this is a busy slide that shows a number of the clinical trials that have been done in, in sarcomatoid renal cell. And this was a trial that uh, was initially done in New York by Janice Dutcher and David Nannis, looking at uh, some very aggressive renal tumors of which a large proportion were, had sarcomatoid features. And they saw these um, responses in these patients, but I think what's the most interesting is that some of these patients had quite durable responses. And uh, I, I realized I made a mistake in the slide. This should be here and this should be here. So they did a follow-up report, and four of the patients that were on this original trial um, were, had a remission that was longer than two years, and two patients were six and eight years since completion of their treatment. We followed up in the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group and did a, another uh, clinical trial using the same regimen, which is a gemcitabine given at a higher dose, 1,500 milligrams every two weeks, and doxorubicin, which is also known as adriamycin, and that's given intravenously every two weeks. And you have to get Nulasta to keep your blood counts up. It's a pretty intense regimen. But we looked at, um, at patients, and um, 38 of these patients had uh, uh, we had one clinical, one complete response, seven partial responses, and ten stable disease. And this was a trial that was open all over the country, whereas this was a two institution study. And so sometimes we do bigger trials all over the country to see if, uh, in real life, if there's a bunch of different doctors treating with this regimen, does it work as well as if you have just a couple doctors working with the regimen? And I think that we also confirmed that we had some patients who did better for uh, you know a two-year period of time or longer, and that's how long we followed them. But there's been movement in the direction of looking at targeted therapies, and so up at uh, up in Boston, Dror Michelson and his group looked at a small trial where a phase one where they treated patients with gemcitabine, and a lower dose of sutent, so 37.5 milligrams of sutent. And in this uh, small, in the initial small group of patients, and I think he's treated a larger number, but I don't have the updated information, um, about a third of these patients had responses. And so that lends some credibility to combining chemotherapy with targeted therapy in this approach. And others have taken this Farther, um, this was a, a review that the Cleveland Clinic did of their patients who had sarcomatoid renal cancer features. They went back and looked at uh, who got VEGF-targeted therapy, so who got retrospectively bevacizumab or sutent or serafinib, and they found in 43 patients that there were four partial responses and 20 stable disease. And so they did see responses in patients. Um, it did seem that the patients who had less sarcomatoid features did better. If they had more clear cell, it was more useful. Um, 
And others have taken this and combined different chemotherapies, gemcitabine with a 5 -F, an oral 5-FU-based drug, and then bevacizumab. This one was, can't report everything, but this was done up in Chicago, and, and they again saw some well-tolerated and some, and some uh, partial responses. And, oh, and I missed Toracel down there. In the analysis of uh, the ARCS trial, they also had sarcomatoid features and had some responses. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip over this. This is the ECOG trial. But what I wanted to point out here is we broke it down into uh, as much as we could. And this, this was kind of a disappointment because we weren't able to get tissue from all of the patients, even though it was an eligibility requirement. We, we had a lot of patients where we couldn't actually get the tissue to follow up and be sure of this. But in looking at what we know, the patients, we did see responses in patients who had a lot of their tumor replaced by sarcomatoid features. And um, we did see responses in both clear cell and non-clear cell cancers with this regimen. So what I would say is that, uh, I'll skip over this, but um, I think that doxorubicin and gemcidebine therapy can lead to durable remissions. Tyrosine kinase and mTOR inhibitors have some activity, and combinations of angiogenic therapies are an area of intense focus. And then I wanted to just briefly talk on some kind of cool tumors that have popped out recently, and Dr. Chuari is getting a lot of attention at this talk. He's done a lot of this work. But this is, uh, this is his slide from a paper, and this is a fish analysis, which is staining, showing that these chromosomes have moved around, parts of the chromosome have jumped to another chromosome, and they've created a protein together and caused these fusion proteins. And it's now recognized that a proportion of mainly clear cell cancers can be these translocation tumors. And I think it just points out that we're getting to realize that more and more of these cancers have, are very different when we look up up close, but the, the bottom line with this is there may be a particular kind of a tubulopapillary pattern that we see with these under the microscope, um, but there have been two reports now looking, and it does look as if some of these cancers at least respond quite well to the standard therapies that we use in clear cell kidney cancer. And then finally, this is a very unusual kidney cancer. This is medullary kidney cancer. This is present only in young patients, generally African-American, who have a sickle cell trait. And probably due to inflammation of the medullary portion of the kidney, um, it's a very, very aggressive disease, uh, uniformly uh, fatal in almost, in almost everybody. And we typically use approaches such as chemotherapy and bladder cancer. There were some reports, uh, I guess MD Anderson did an an analysis of their patients and found that patients who got anti-angiogenic therapy, bevacizumab-based therapy, seemed to do better in combination with chemo. And then um, recently there was a report of a mutation in the ALK gene, and there are now ALK inhibitors that are under development, so another area uh, to branch out. And then finally, collecting duct cancer is um, as I was mentioning before, it's, it's of the lining of the kidney, but it's not quite upper tract tumor. It's kind of a, a transitional area between kidney cancer and, and urothelial, and we tend to treat those also with, with chemotherapy agents. So these are trials that are, um, you know, directions that I would point people to for consideration of therapies. And I listed here the adjuvant trials because these are adjuvant trials that are open. This is open in the United Kingdom. This is imminently open in the U.S. And the Assure trial is now closed. But these all are enrolling non-clear cell patients. And I'd like to, um, you know, make a plea that if anybody participates in this, please, please let us study your tissue so we can learn more about who would benefit. So final conclusions, what is it? what is in it for you. The more we look at kidney cancers, I think the more differences and the more complicated it, it gets. But the molecular characteristics that we're identifying are opening new avenues indeed, 
and your participation in clinical trials and willingness to allow characteristics, characterization of your individual cancers is crucial for advancing the field. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Join us again next month for another edition of Kidney Cancer News. I'm Carrie Kanoski, wishing you good health. Hi, I'm Denise Richards. In 2007, I lost my mom to kidney cancer. Like most people who are diagnosed with this disease, my family didn't know much about it, and unfortunately, by the time she was diagnosed, there wasn't much that could be done. I'm asking you to help the Kidney Cancer Association stop the pain and suffering caused by this disease. Check out kidneycancer.org for information on how the association is helping patients and their families through research, education, and advocacy. And please consider making a donation by clicking on Donate Now and help us achieve our vision of a world without kidney cancer.